This is Ari Koretsky and welcome to Jews You Should Know, introducing the broader community to interesting and inspiring Jewish men and women making a difference in our world. Some are already famous, some not yet so, but each is a Jew you should know. We are here with Alan Dershowitz, famed constitutional attorney, longtime law professor, champion of Israel. How are you, Professor Dershowitz? I'm doing great. How about you? Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, very, very busy schedule. You know, you're uh, traveling, and uh, thank you for squeezing us in here. Um, just to get started, as we've been doing with all our guests, uh, wanted to get a sense of your personal background, where you've come from, and how you grew up, maybe a little bit about your early Jewish identity. Um, I know there's a lot there, so... Uh, Give us a taste. Well, I was born in Williamsburg to a family uh, that was born in America. My father and mother were born on the Lower East Side to parents that had come over from Poland, from Galicia. Um, my grandparents helped to found the Torah Vadas Yeshiva in Williamsburg, as well as the Young Israel of Brooklyn, the first Young Israel. Wow. Uh, uh, my parents moved to Borough Park when I was about four. I went to Yeshiva Eitzchayim. I went to another yeshiva, Torah Semis, a Yiddish-speaking school for two years and learned a little Yiddish, a bissel Yiddish. And then I went to Eskayim, and then I went to Brooklyn Tamutical Academy, which is the Yeshiva University High School of Brooklyn. I was a terrible, terrible yeshiva student. Uh, <laughs> one of my highest grades was pain on me minus, mediocre minus. <laughs> I didn't even make it to mediocrity. <laughs> Um, when my principal, Rabbi Zarif, called me in for a guidance session uh, in high school, he says, look, Dershowitz, you got a big mouth, you got a good mouth, but you don't have a Yiddish cup, you don't have a good Jewish brain, uh, we got to figure out something you can do where you use your mouth, but not your head. He said, I have two suggestions. One, you could become a lawyer, or two, you could become a conservative rabbi. And he had only contempt for conservative wow. rabbi. Uh, I wasn't smart enough to be a rabbi, so I became a lawyer. I made it into Brooklyn College by the skin of my teeth. I didn't have the grades to get in, but I took a test. And I also won a New York State scholarship. So I was a, you know, I was a smart kid, but I was just not a good student. So I went to Brooklyn College on a New York State scholarship, and I was first in my class among the men at Brooklyn College, and then first in my class at Yale Law School and editor-in-chief of the Yale Law Journal. But notwithstanding all of that, I got turned down by 32 out of 32 Wall Street firms. They weren't hiring Jews named Dershowitz from Brooklyn uh, in those days. If your name was Lehman, they might hire you. But if your name was Dershowitz from Poland, you didn't have a chance. So wow. um, I couldn't work for a Wall Street firm. I worked for a Jewish firm for one summer, loved it. But then I got the invitation to teach at Harvard when I was, the invitation came when I was 20 years old. Wow. I'm a professor. I started teaching when I was 25 and became a full professor at 28. I was the youngest in the school's history. And I had a 50-year career where I taught 10,000 students, including some of our major national initiators. So it's been a, an interesting career. I'm in the process now of writing a book, a memoir of 70 years of Defend Israel, starting in 1948 with the establishment of Israel and continuing to the present time. I do it decade by decade, uh, figuring out how differently Israel has been over every decade and how much more difficult it has been to defend Israel, certainly over the past three or four decades, when I've become most actively involved in the defense of Israel. Wow, I mean, there's so much there, there's so much there to unpack. Just, uh, I'm so curious, you know, going back to that original uh, upbringing that you had, it sounds like it was a very, very Jewishly rich uh, upbringing. And what do you think about the environment? I don't know, it prevented you or, or what about it did you not, uh, take to because it sounds like you know obviously they missed either they missed your mind or or you just were not motivated and inspired to apply your skills at the time to that Jewish environment. What do you think was was going on there as a young student? Well, I was always a question. I always raised questions about everything. I never took anything at face value. In college and law school, that was a plus. In yeshiva, not so much. Um, I was also a bandit. I was a troublemaker, um, <laughs> not in the sense of anything serious, but I was a joke teller. Uh, you know, I like playing ball. I like flirting with the girls. Um, I was always a leader. Uh, I was never a member of a club that I wasn't the president of it. When we started out when I was a kid, we had a little club called the Palm 
Hamach, named after the Israeli uh, strike force, I was the president. <laughs> we had a club called The Shields. Then in college, there was uh, Nighthouse. I was the president of that, and I was the captain of the debating team and the president of the student body at college. So I always had leadership. I was editor-in-chief of the ALO Journal, so I had leadership skills, which people recognize. But my kind of intellectual skills that have helped me through my adult life, raising questions uh, didn't stand well with some of the rabbis in yeshiva. And although I was orthodox, I'm a rule abider. I, I never even ate a Nabisco cookie until I was 27 years old. If it didn't have the U, I wouldn't have eat it. And I put on tefillin every single day until I was 27. And at 27, I stopped being orthodox. I maintained my strong commitment to the Jewish community, but it wasn't any longer based on theology or religion, where I'm also very, I quit everything, but based much more on my commitment to Jewish values, my commitment to Israel, my uh, fight against anti-Semitism. So I still go to an Orthodox shul. I go to Park East. Um, I love the rabbi and the chazan, Rabbi Schneier and chazan Helfgott. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention, I was a choir boy. <laughs> of both Beryl Hagi and Moshe Kusevitsky. Wow. <laughs> you know, beautiful. So, you know, I know the liturgy pretty well. <laughs> I worked my way through college teaching bar mitzvah lessons, even a few bat mitzvah lessons, because I taught in Temple Emanuel, which was a conservative shul in Borough Park. So uh, now I have a minion in my house uh, on Martha's Vineyard, uh, for just the high holidays, for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, we have 40, 50 people come, and huh. I and, and a woman named Elisa Levine, who went to Ramaz, we conduct the services together, and we have a good time doing it. We do it our way. <laughs> yeah, I'm so curious. Do you think, looking back, had you had some more, call it progressive or uh, just simply adaptable educators, do you think that your your Jewish career may have turned out differently? In other words, the people had welcomed questioning and, and embraced that. If I had Yitz Greenberg as my teacher, uh, or Ravi Weiss as uh, my teacher, or Shlomo Riskin as my teacher, or Norman Lamb as my teacher, or Elie Wiesel, uh, you name them. You know, some of the great rabbis today who are uh, so, uh, so wonderful, I think I would have tried to operate within the club rather than outside of the club. You know, many of my teachers, remember, I started elementary school basically in 1945. So many of my teachers were Holocaust survivors. Right. And they had come from the yeshiva in Europe. And they were not adapted to teaching American kids particularly well. And questions were often responded by a slap in the face. Aye. Or I remember uh, once making, I thought, a creative point about some Talmudic issue. And I never forget my rabbi's answer. He says, if it was such a good question, then the rabbis before you were so much smarter than you would have thought of it first. Oh, uh, terrible. If the rabbis who were so much smarter than you didn't think of it first, then it can't be such a good question. So that was the attitude I got from so many of the rabbis. I had some good teachers in high school, and I learned a lot. Uh, you know, I still regard myself as pretty knowledgeable on Jewish issues. I, I love to read the Torah, and I love to read, you know, other sources within uh, Judaism. I've written books from a Jewish perspective. I wrote a book about Abraham, uh, Abraham, the world's first, but certainly not last Jewish lawyer. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going back to the original sources. Do you ever have a relationship with Talmud study uh, to, at this point in time? Yeah. A little bit. I'm more of a Karai, I think. Um, I'm more <laughs> of a, a Rambam guy. I, I just gave it to our Torah the other night at a bar mitzvah. And as I said, two things. Number one, I have never read a barsha that didn't have some residence for the bar mitzvah or the bar mitzvah person. Uh, they always seem to speak to them directly. And second, if I had only one book that I could take with me to a desert island with my students, it would be the Torah. Because you can learn uh, poetry, art, music, uh, literature, history, philosophy, religion. Uh, science, uh, you can learn so much if you view it in a kind of questioning way. If you don't say, you know, Avraham was the greatest person in the history of the world, but Avraham was a deeply flawed great man. Um, you know, the difference between Judaism and the two major uh, Abrahamic religions is that nobody can criticize Jesus, nobody can criticize Muhammad. They are perfect human beings according to their 
religious sources, but there are no religious leaders within Judaism, with the possible exception of Ephraim, uh, who doesn't appear much in the Bible, who is not deeply flawed. And it's a much better learning experience to learn from flawed people with whom you can sometimes uh, identify. You know, Avram argues with God over strangers, the sinners of Saddam. How dare you, God, not do justice? And then when God says, take your son, your only son, bring him up and sacrifice your God, anything you say. Um, if, if you don't understand that there's a conflict there and it has to be resolved, then you're not studying the texts up properly. So we have to deal with these conflicts and deal with them in creative fashions. Well, have you found that some of your Jewish students over the years, those that have been steeped in Jewish learning have been at an advantage, per se? I tell my students in the first week of the first class of law school, if you have a really good Talmudic background or a good Jesuit background, you're going to have an advantage. Interesting. In Why Jesuit? Because they also do dialectic and okay. argument. Um, you know, Justice Scalia, uh, obviously, was a brilliant, and he loved the Talmud, uh, Justice Scalia, because he understood the relationship between Jewish dialogue and Catholic dialogue. Uh, but the advantage will only last for a few months. Uh, Interesting. And other students will catch up. But Jewish students, traditionally, if they have a good yeshiva education, have done quite well at elite law schools. And I've helped mentor a great many of them. Well, wow. so you were at Yale Law School, and then it sounds like at some point you matriculated professionally over to Harvard. How did that happen? Was that a uh, point of tension? <laughs> Well, no. Uh, I decided I wanted to strike out on my own. I could have gone to Yale Law School and taught there, uh, or Columbia, or NYU, any of the schools. They all offered me jobs. But I wanted to be in a different place. I didn't want to teach along with my teachers. Uh -huh. I wanted to strike out on my own and be independent. I also wanted to have an impact on the world. And I thought uh, Harvard is the greatest academic platform from which to be a public intellectual. Uh, People respect you probably more than they should if you have a hard uh, professorship attached to you. So, you know, I took advantage of that. Margaret took advantage of me. We had a mutually good 50 years together. <laughs> and now I'm retired. And I'm not one of these people who retires partway. Uh, when I stopped teaching, I stopped teaching. That was it. I now litigating, writing, traveling, uh, making trouble, <laughs> uh, and, and uh, doing a lot, of, a lot of things. And I'm approaching my 80th birthday. Wow. And Ken Hara. God gives me the strength. Uh, to continue, I'm going to try to continue, you know, having some kind of an impact. Some people think positive, some people think negative. <laughs> I guess it depends who you're asking, obviously. Um, but as a professor, did you go into academia because these Wall Street firms were close to you as a Jew? Or did you want to go into academia, you know, conceptually? Oh, no, I always wanted to be a professor. Uh, once I went to Yale Law School, I knew I was going to be a professor. Uh, I wanted to maybe work for a year or two years at a Wall Street firm maybe to pick up some experience, but that was not to be. And when Harvard made me the offer at a young age, I decided not to turn it down. I also thought about going to government. Justice Goldberg, for whom I was a law clerk, had gotten me a job with Bobby Kennedy as the attorney general. But I decided to go right to Harvard. And of course, as fate would have it, uh, John Kennedy was murdered while I was a law clerk, and uh, Bobby Kennedy quit shortly thereafter, so it probably was not to be anyway. Right. And so I'm, you know, I made career choices. Uh, I didn't have any mentors, really. My parents were not a college. Uh, I was the first person in my family to, uh, to be a college graduate, and I didn't have many professionals in my family, so I didn't have a lot of guidance. So I made my own decisions kind of in a bootstrap way, but, you know, they turned out well for me. What about academia appeal to you as opposed to perhaps more lucrative, maybe in some ways exciting arena of litigation and, and those sorts of things? Well, I love teaching and I'm a natural teacher because I love raising questions. I love answering questions. I love my students. Um, it puts me on the forefront of, of the cutting edge of everything. I get new young people every year when I taught new ideas, new information. I not only taught, by the way, at Harvard Law School, I taught for years at Harvard College. As oh. well. I taught freshman seminars, so I taught 18-year-old kids coming right out of high school. A course called Where Does Your Morality Come From? Interesting. I talked about philosophy, religion, science, a uh, range of other psychology. Subjective morality and... Yeah. No, I, I did, went through the science of objective morality, poo-pooed it quite a bit, but... Um, I wrote a book about it called Rice from Wrongs, A Secular Theory of the Origin of Rights. So whatever I've taught, I've written about. And in 50 years of teaching, I taught 50 different classes. 
Every year, I insisted on teaching a new class, and almost every class I taught had an and in it. I started out by teaching law and psychoanalysis, law and psychiatry, law and medicine, law and mathematics, law and philosophy, law and literature, law and Shakespeare, and finally, law and baseball. I taught a course on law and baseball with uh, the president of the Red Sox. Um, Theo Epstein or John? No, 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 no. Uh, Theo was the general GM. Uh, manager, and uh, we invited uh, some of the ball players to come to my house. Uh, Kevin Euclid, who I've maintained a friendship with, who was a, a Jewish third baseman, first baseman for the Boston uh, Red Sox. Uh, I took the course with Larry Lucchino, who was a great lawyer, yes. a great president of the Boston Red Sox. We became really close, close friends, and I'm now friendly with John Henry, who's the owner of the Boston Red Sox. Uh, I'm also friendly with Bob Kraft. Uh, and who I'm trying to get on the podcast, by the way, if you can shoot him a little uh, recommendation. Also, Jeffrey. Oh my goodness. Are you going to head up to Minnesota? Uh, I think I'm going to watch it from home. <laughs> right. I mean, we usually have a Super Bowl party uh, where we have kosher deli because a lot of my friends in Miami are, are Orthodox and kosher. So everybody gets to eat whatever they want at our house. Wonderful. Is that where you spend a good amount of your time nowadays? I, we spend a lot of our time in Miami, much of it, um, the whole winter. And some other times when we have a chance to get there, it's it's a wonderful place filled with culture. Uh, we're right next to the New World Symphony where we go at least once a week. Beautiful. We're near the Arts Center. We walk on the boardwalk. Um, so it's a, it's a nice life in Miami. I'm busy because I speak a lot down there, write a lot, and travel from there. I just came back from uh, travels going around the world. We're ho hoping to go to Israel for Yom Ha'atzmaut, and which I've done every... Day. It was at the 30th, 40th, 50th, 60th, and now 70th uh, anniversary of Israel. Hope to make it to the 80th. Wow. That sounds like it, it dovetails nicely with the book you're working on. Professor, I, I'm so curious. There's so many landmark kids that you've been involved in, right up to one that just recently uh, concluded, uh, which, which I'll get to in a little bit. But from your perspective, what have been some of the most interesting or personally meaningful? You know, you can read about these cases online close question it's not even a close question the most meaningful and the most interesting was natan sharansky um uh, you know i always often said to natan there but for the grace of god go i if, if your parents uh had made a left turn and come to america and my parents had made a right turn and gone to uh russia i'd be the dissident you'd be the lawyer and i know you'd be helping me and so when i got the phone call from his wife and his mother back in the late 1970s yep. he'd been uh arrested I knew that it was going to be a case of a lifetime. And I worked with uh, his senior, senior lawyer, Erwin Kotler. We worked together hand in glove. Uh, but Erwin did the laboring law of writing this, like, 500-page brief. I wow. Did of, I did a lot of work in the United States diplomatically, politically, politically legally. And when he walked over the Glenicky Bridge, it was one of the great moments of my life. And then when he threw his arms around me and whispered in my ear, Baruch Matir Asurim. Blessed are those who fee the imprisoned, you know, from the bracha, from the Shemona Esrei. It was the biggest fee I ever earned in my life. I did the case free, pro bono, but it was the biggest fee I ever earned in my entire life, seeing him walk free, because I had such a strong identification with him. And his wife had begged me to make sure he got out in time so that she could have children with him. And uh, wow. just made it. And Unbelievable. Girl, uh, who I see when I go to Israel, if I have a close friendship with that time. We don't agree about everything, but they do smile. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. So I guess beyond the Sharansky case and maybe cases that were important within American jurisprudence, what were some that really stood out for you? I know OJ is probably the most famous. Um, yeah, but probably one of the least significant in terms of legal precedent. It was really more a reflection of racial tensions in America than a great, great a case. Um, you know, I've had a tremendous number of cases uh, from the Supreme Court to the lowest courts. And every time I free an innocent person, um, it brings me such incredible joy. Sometimes I free guilty people. That doesn't bring me as much joy. But if they have a, an excessive sentence or if they're facing the death penalty, I've had you know, half a dozen death penalty cases and I've, I've managed to save the lives of all the people that I've had on, on death row, um, I've had about, oh, many, many murder cases, and I've won the vast, vast majority of, of them. 
the most famous ones, of course, are uh, Klaus von Bülow, about which the movie was made, Reversal of Fortune. That was an attempted murder case. Uh, O.J. Simpson. I represented the woman who was uh, accused of killing the owner of Binion's Casino. And I've had so many, so many uh, homicide cases. And I've won them all by the use of science. Because I'm an expert in the relationship between law and science, I use my scientific background. And I urge anybody who's watching this podcast, if you want to become a criminal lawyer, learn science. Huh. You have to learn genetics. You have to learn kinds of scientific principles in order to be able to question the scientific basis for conviction. So it's very, very important. Your, your remarks remind me of, of course, the most recent case in which you helped free someone, and that was the Rubashkin case. Here we are in January of 2018. Um, what was your take on that case? You know, I, there's been a really interesting public debate around that case, whereas I, I think any objective onlooker appreciates that it was a draconian sentence and, and way out of line, and yet... So that's the question I have is, do you, do you believe that it was, uh, the, you know, some have cl- characterized it as sort of the greatest uh, miscarriage of justice, of, of judicial overreach and, and prosecutorial misconduct that they've seen and others saying, well, you know, it was just a really bad decision, but we shouldn't be out there in the streets dancing and, and celebrating. Where do you kind of come down on the whole issue? Well, I've seen too much to be able to say anything is the worst abuse. I've seen so many terrible abuses. You know, when I was a kid, I saw a woman executed for a crime she didn't commit, Ethel Rosenberg. And I was active as a 13 and 14 year old in trying to save her life. So there are too many abuses uh, to list number one, two, or three. But the horrible combination of factors in that case a judge who never should have sat on the case because she was too involved in helping with the search and the seizure, a prosecutor who deliberately elevated the sentence by interfering with the sale of the company. A judge who then exceeded the recommendation of the excessive prosecutor and gave an even harsher sentence. I cannot explain that sentence in any rational way other than by saying that he was a chassid in a land, in a a state in which chassidim was seen as outsiders and strangers. And I think the fact that he was a chassid from Brooklyn was the determining factor in how he was treated. You can call that anti-Semitism, you can call it bigotry. It's just not the way law should operate. That's why we were able to get Republicans, Democrats, prosecutors, defense attorneys, liberals, conservatives, Jews, Gentiles, white, black, men, women, all together calling for a commutation of the sentence. And, you know, finally, I was lucky. I was sitting in the Oval Office talking about the Middle East, and the opportunity arose, and I told the president about the Ravashkin case, and I told him how the prosecutor had manipulated the sale price of the company, knowing that he was a businessman, that he would understand that argument, and he did understand that argument. And he said he would like to try to do something about that, and he called in his people and said, you know, please talk to Alan and see if there's anything we can do about this, and then a few months later the release occurred. But the the credit goes to so many people, to Aleph, which is the Chabad prisoners' organization, and Rabbi uh, Lipsker and Rabbi Boyarsky and so many other people, to Gary Apple, lawyer, to his earlier lawyers, Nat Lewin. So many people deserve credit uh, for this. And the former prosecutors, Louis Free, the former head of the FBI, who put their energy into this, even though they were not Jewish or certainly not part of the Hasidic community. So I support the dancing in the streets. I think you dance in the street every time an injustice is reversed. I dance in the street, whether it's a Jewish injustice that's reversed, an African-American injustice, or injustice toward anybody, because injustice toward anybody is injustice toward everybody. And ultimately, if we allow an unjust system to continue to operate, it will come back and haunt us. As the great theologian said, when they came for the Jews, I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew, etc., etc. When they came for me, there was no one left to speak up. So even if you have just a selfish view, you should selfishly oppose injustice toward anyone. Uh, I heard a story in your name about a young child and the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Is is it true or not true? Set the record straight for us. (laughs) I'll tell you what I know. Uh, What I know is that the letter was sent. It was sent to me. I got the letter to the right people in the White House. This was a young Hasidic boy who was sick? That's right. All that part of it, as far as I know, is true. And I think it's true that the letter got to the president. The part of it that is that I cried and cried as they read the letter together. I have no knowledge of that at all. <laughs> and um, I just don't know that that part of it's true. But I can tell you that the beginning part of it is true. 
That sounds good. <laughs> to, uh, to... And, and it, look, for a young boy to do this is a tremendous thing. So I, I'm so glad that uh, if it had any impact, um, thank you. Whatever your name is, man, and I hope I hope you're, you're doing okay. You mentioned Nat Lewin a minute ago, and I interviewed him earlier uh, in one of the first volumes. Terrific, man. One of the really interesting topics we discussed, and it sounds like it's something that you're also passionate about, is judicial reform and the notion of sort of innocence projects and what seems to be a really growing awareness and growing movement. A lot of podcasts, you know, from Serial and and all the spinoffs thereof have really brought those topics to the light. Uh, is it something that you are actively engaged in? Absolutely. And let me tell you what I think the single most important reform is, and that is how we pick judges and prosecutors. We should never elect a judge or a prosecutor. They should be picked from commissions of lawyers, professors, lay people. Nobody should be running for office while a prosecutor or a judge or letting public opinion influence their decisions. The second most important thing is we have to break up the Justice Department. It should be broken up into two separate independent sections. One, we should have a minister of justice like Israel has or like England has, which is an advisor to the president, overtly political, a member of the cabinet. You do what the president wants you to do or you're fired. That should be the minister of justice. Then there should be an independent, independent attorney general, call him that. In Israel, it's called the attorney general. In England, it's called the director of public prosecution. The person in charge of deciding who to prosecute should not be under the influence of the president, should not be political, should be outside of politics. The founding fathers of our Constitution and the early people who wrote the laws made a fundamental mistake by blending these two roles together, and it creates an inherent conflict of interest, and it's why we need special counsel and special prosecutors. Israel doesn't need special prosecutors. It has a full-time special prosecutor. He's the Attorney General of Israel. The same thing is true in England. The director of public prosecution is not under the direct influence of the prime minister or the cabinet. And that's the approach we should take in this country. So law reform is essential. We also have to reduce sentences. Sentences are much, much too harsh. And we have to go back to a situation where we balance justice and Rahman. Remember the Torah says, Sedek, Sedek. It uses Sedek, Sedek twice, Tirdov. And one Sedek is absolute justice, but the other tzedek has an element of rachmanut, of rachmanus uh, in it. And you need to blend compassion and absolute justice, one without the other, just as the sign of result that we should be proud of. Do you see that the criminal justice system uh, should be designed to help reform and remediate people, and that's not happening? Uh, what's your opinion on that? I think it has to perform many functions. For some people, there's no remediation. You get that guy who's been on television recently who murdered two policemen in cold blood and said he wished he had murdered more. There's no remedy for him. We have to just build a wall. I don't mean a Trump wall. I mean bars and keep him behind those bars for the rest of his life. He must die in prison. Uh, there's no, don't try to rehabilitate him. Don't try to reform him. There is genuine evil in the world and there is irremediable evil in the world. We have to recognize that, but we also have to recognize that when a 16-year-old kid gets lured into a gang or has to sell cocaine in order to feed his mother, that, you know, maybe there's a chance he could turn out to be a great citizen. I've seen that with my own eyes. I've seen kids gone to prison and ended up being contributors of the world. So we have to know when it's appropriate to remediate, when it's appropriate not to. And our justice system has to do all of that at the same time. It's very complicated. It's very difficult. It's a real challenge. That's why our Torah says, Tzedek, 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 That's one of the primary commandments. I have that in my office, hang on the wall, as a guide to my life. Well, just to pivot and uh, moving towards uh, towards the end here, you obviously, as you, as you mentioned, have a very longstanding and celebrated relationship with Israel. I just want to understand a little bit more how that's, been nurtured over the years and sort of what your current relationship is and, and what you're involved with. Okay, it sounds like an ad for my new book. Um, <laughs> Perfect. In about, I hope we'll in about six or eight months. Oh, wonderful. Um, as I tell that story, of course, in great detail, it really starts with the 67 war, uh, in the run-up to the 67 war, when I was about to get tenure. And a professor at Harvard said, you have to stop advocating for Israel. You're wearing your Jewishness on your sleeve. won't help you get tenure. And I said, look, you have to take me as I am. That's who I am. And I was very active in the run-up to the 67 war. And then in the early 70s, when the left turned against Israel with Chomsky and 
uh, the Reverend Berrigan and uh, a little later Norman Finkelstein and some of the other people turned the left against Israel. The Soviet Union, of course, uh, started the campaign to call Zionism racism. Uh, that's when I really became deeply involved because it fit into my personality, defend the underdog, fight for justice. And so I would say the period of the 1970s, uh, 73, the Berrigan State of Israel being the community, 75, the UN resolution equating Zionism with racism, um, Chomsky, um, those are the things that made me energized and made it clear that I had to devote a very significant part of my life to the just defense of Israel. Were there the trips that you took there early on that sort of animated you? I imagine your first, when, when was your first time there? Well, I was so lucky. I went to Israel in 1970 on behalf of the Advocates, a television show. In that trip, I met Golda Meir, Rabin, Perez, Begin, every important political leader I met during that trip. And I befriended many of them. Wow. Some of them remain lifelong friends. Around the same time, I met a young student in the United States named Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, and we became lifelong friends. So the early 70s marked the period when I got to know virtually all the Israeli political leaders, and I've known every prime minister of Israel since Golda Meir, and Golda Meir served me chicken soup in her house. <laughs> the kitchen cabinet, uh, they called it, right? Right, and when I... Go to Israel. I fortunately, my wife and I always get invited by Sarah and Benjamin Netanyahu to their home for dinner, and so we become close personal friends. I was friendly with Rabin and um, remain friendly with some members of his family, great great people. But I also know Abbas. I also know Fayyad. I also know people from the Palestinian side. I also know Erekat. Uh, I mean, I know many of these people. I'm not friendly with them. But <laughs> I've met with them. I've had dinners with them. We've had long conversations, and I'm a strong advocate of a peaceful resolution uh, of the conflict in the Middle East based on a mutual uh, sacrifices, but consistent with Israel's security, which comes first. Are you an optimist on that front? You know, they say in Israel, the difference between an optimist and a pessimist is a pessimist is one who says things are so bad they can't get any worse. An optimist says, yes, they can. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not that kind of an optimist. Um uh, I am an optimist. I do think that the circumstances are ripe for a mutually accepted compromise, but the politics are not there. The politics in Israel are moving toward the right. The politics in the United States are uncertain, but I would hope that we certainly have a better basis than we did under the Obama administration. Obama set back the cause of peace in the Middle East considerably. Obama strengthened Iran. Obama strengthened Syria. Obama weakened um, Israel and Israel's allies uh, in the Middle East. And I think in the end, Obama will go down in history as a good domestic president and a very bad foreign relations president. Interesting. What do you think about his worldview? Um, and I imagine, did you know Obama at Harvard? I did, yeah. What were your, what were your early thoughts? And, and what I do you always thought he was going to be a leader. Um, his mentor was my closest friend on the faculty, Charles Ogletree. And so I saw him many times at Ogletree's office. Uh, look, uh, his main problem is he didn't have a foreign policy. He had a foreign ideology. Mm. And you can't rule by ideology. And he was uh, an ideologue and an idealist. And I don't think he was very good at calculating the complexities of what happens when you make a promise that you will respond to Syrian atrocities and you fail to keep that promise or when you give Iran the greatest exporter of terrorism billions and billions of dollars to spend on terrorism. I just don't think that's the way to conduct a foreign policy. And I think Obama will go down in history as a failure when it comes to foreign policy, but as a success when it comes to domestic policy. Life's complex. And, you know, when you ask me who the great presidents are, they all had flaws and they all had difficulties. Presidents, like uh, biblical characters, are often deeply flawed, personally deeply flawed. Um, some of the greatest presidents had some of the deepest flaws and nonetheless performed great. Lyndon Johnson is a perfect example of a deeply flawed man with all kinds of negative personal attributes who was one of the great domestic presidents in American history in terms of civil rights. So, you know, human beings are complex. That's why, again, why the Torah is so educational, because it's the first book of that kind, religious book, that presents its leaders with all of their complexities. Just in sort of in closing, Professor, I'm so curious with 
50 years at Harvard and travels around the world in so many of the the most exceptional circles of, of politics and intellect. And who are some of the most brilliant minds that you've encountered or some of the most inspiring personalities that you've encountered? Well, I have to put Yitz Greenberg uh, near the very, very top of that list. Interesting. Uh, Yitz was one of my great mentors. He grew up uh, three blocks away from me. I remember his father. He was a towering, in both the literal, because he's six foot three or something, uh, a towering intellect. Um, I followed him wherever he went. I was four years behind him at Brooklyn Tim Medical Academy. We were both captains of the debate team. I was four years behind him at Brooklyn College. He was at Harvard when I got to uh, Harvard. I am his Talmud. Uh, I follow him wherever he goes. And then we are mishpacha, but through marriage. His son married my late first cousin. Uh, and so I see him now at many of our family events. I would say, if you have to ask about great Jews of the 20th and 21st century, it's ranks very high, along with Elie Wiesel, along with Erwin Cutler, my friend from Canada. Uh, I would put some of Israel's leaders at the very top of that list. I only met Ben-Gurion uh, at a distance, but certainly Ben-Gurion and, and Golda Meir and Begin and Rabin and Perez and Netanyahu have to rank uh, among great leaders uh, of the Jewish world. You know, I've met presidents from Kennedy forward, um, another great rabbi, my rabbi, Rabbi Schneier, does great things around the world for international brother and sisterhood. So, you know, we live in an age of many, many great people, and I'm fortunate to have known and liked and enjoyed friendships with uh, many of them. That's one of the great prizes of the world, Natan Sharansky. Uh, there are so many. I, I know I'm going to leave many out, and I feel terrible about that, but I can attribute it to a senior moment. <laughs> Almost 80. How about some of your students that you've had the privilege of educating who have gone on to great things? Well, I've had too many, to, and there I know I'm going to say that I've been privileged. When I looked at it in my first year class in criminal law, I would always say to my students, what you see is 150 scared students. I see the future president of the United States, the future editor-in-chief of the New York Times, the future managing partner of Goldman Sachs, the future secretary of defense, the future chief justice of the United States, men and women alike. And I've been so privileged to be able to teach so many of the leaders. And when I travel abroad, I'll have people come over to me in heights of government say, you don't remember me, but I was in your elective class on law and psychiatry in 1966, or I took your seminar on this and that in 1974. And it's such a privilege to have taught so many people. And, you know, I continue to try to be a teacher on television. I'm not predictable. When I'm on Fox, I say things that the <laughs> Fox audience doesn't like. When I'm on CNN, I say things the CNN audience doesn't like. And so, uh, fortunately, I'm in a position in my life where I can say what I think. I have nobody to answer to except my wonderful wife, Carolyn, <laughs> and my wonderful children and grandchildren who never stop loving me and criticizing me at the same time. <laughs> and uh, so I'm very fortunate with my family and fortunate with my friends. You know, I have a group of, uh, there's eight couples that we grew up together in Borough Park. We all went to Yeshiva Chaim together. They went to Flatbush Yeshiva. I wasn't smart enough to get into Flatbush, so I went to BTA. <laughs> but we still get together a couple of times a year. Wow. And, and reminisce and talk about the good old days. We're all turning 80. Some of them already have this year. And so far, you know, without trying to give a Kanina Hara, we've been relatively healthy and energetic, and I hope it continues for some more years. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Professor Alan Dershowitz. We will look forward to that book on Israel coming out in a few months. And look for you on television. I also have another book coming out oh. called The Case Against BDS. And I'm trying to make it available on college campuses all over the country. So if anybody wants to help by donating, say, 100 books to the college that you went to or the college of your choice, it would be, I think, a go to a good course. Fabulous. It's an e-book and a soft cover book. Oh, fabulous. It's available at the end of January. I want every single college campus in the United States. Terrific. We just, uh, at University of Maryland, uh, where I work my day job, we just knocked down a BDS resolution. But the same night or the night before, University of Michigan uh, had one, which was, you know, which more successful. And, you know, I used to live in Hyattsville when I was a law clerk, and I used to go over to College Park and watch the... Uh, Terps? Basketball team. There we go. Oh, Coldfield, Coldfield House or before that? 
but I remember uh, uh, schmoozing with my friend Larry David, and because he was there at the university at the time, I went and watched basketball. Games. Wow! But two kids from Brooklyn, we never ran into each other. I'll tell you something about Larry David. He actually lived uh, in the Tep fraternity house, which is currently the house that I uh, rent as our Jewish center on campus. So uh, there's a lot of. Larry, hard to imagine Larry in a fraternity. <laughs> Apparently, he was the president. <laughs> Did you grow up together with him, or? No, no, no. I'm, I'm older than he is, but uh, we lived near each other on Martha's Vineyard. Ah. Uh, Good friends uh, over the summers, and you know we see each other. If I go to California, he comes to New York. So he's a great guy and a funny guy and uh, a very, very smart guy. We have very, very serious intellectual discussions. Really? He is very brilliant, very opinionated, as you might imagine. Right. Yeah. Have you ever been spoofed in uh, any of his programs? No. I was on Saturday Night Live. I've been spoofed. And other places. I don't think he's ever created a character based on me. Don't give him any. <laughs> Your secret is safe with me uh, unless he listens. But uh, in any case, thank you so, so much, Professor Alan Dershowitz. A great honor and a privilege to speak with you today. And God bless you for many more years of health and productivity and uh, championing wonderful causes around America and around the world. Thank you. Keep doing great things. Amen. Thank you so much. Take care. This has been Ari Koretsky on Jews You Should Know. Please visit us at JewsYouShouldKnow.com and subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you consume podcasts. Find us on social media at Jews You Should Know. If you'd like to become a supporter of this podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. And you can do so by visiting Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Jews You Should Know. Finally, if you have enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review so that we can continue to grow and introduce many more people to Jews You Should Know.